Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Festival of Ideas. My name is Alexandra Genova, I'm a PhD student here at the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, and this is a brief introduction to the history of dress in Anglo-Saxon England. When I was preparing this talk, I initially wanted to talk about the clothing of characters from Anglo-Saxon literature, but there was a slight problem with this idea. Anglo-Saxon writers hardly ever describe what their characters were wearing. It seems essential to us, as readers, to know at least a little bit about a character's appearance, but the Anglo-Saxons did not feel the same way. How then should we dress them in our imagination? This talk is an attempt to summarise what we do know about Anglo-Saxon dress, how we know it, and what it all means for us as readers of early English literature. I would like to note, though, that for the sake of brevity, I will very likely miss out on many of the details and the changes which must have taken place in English costume during the Anglo-Saxon age, an era spanning six centuries, a distance as great as between the present day and the Renaissance. So, for anyone looking for a more nuanced discussion, there will be a list of sources in the description box below. To start from the very beginning, we need to look at the works of the Roman historian Tacitus, writing in the first century, who describes the clothing of the barbarians inhabiting Germania, stating that they usually just wear a single cloak over their naked bodies, and that the clothing of Germanic men and women is not entirely different. Now, there are a few problems with this. For one, Tacitus himself had never been to Germania, and what he makes of his sources is likely wrong, and even more significantly, while we do find lots of brooches which must have held together a cloak in the Anglo-Saxon period, most of them were made nearly five centuries after Tacitus, so we know very little about the developments that must have taken place during this time. What we can say with certainty is that the Anglo-Saxons did not run around naked, as Tacitus suggests. But because fabric falls apart so quickly in British weather, it's very hard to find actual clothing from this period. When trying to piece it all together, historians rely mainly on non-perishable objects, like brooches and belt buckles, and even more significantly on illustrations in manuscripts. When we look at artwork as evidence for dress, however, we need to consider our sources very carefully, since art tends to be, to use a technical term, iconographic. This means that Anglo-Saxon artists were not necessarily drawing from life, but probably imagined a generic costume that fit the characters they were representing. Not only that, but most of these manuscripts were made in the last century and a half of the Anglo-Saxon era. And even if we assume that a manuscript illustration of King Alfred, or say, the Virgin Mary, is an accurate depiction of contemporary clothing, we are still missing many important details. For instance, because all female figures in Anglo-Saxon illuminations wear veils, we do not have a single depiction of the neckline. And if we turn to written evidence to supplement whatever we're missing from art, we find that although there is a decent number of wills where women describe their wardrobes, they are more concerned with which dress goes to whom rather than what they looked like. So is this it then? Are we concluding that our evidence is insufficient and the Anglo-Saxons will forever remain naked in our imagination? Well, not quite. We can still make quite a few educated guesses about their dress and the changes it underwent. For instance, the fact that women's graves from the pagan period often contain paired brooches, as well as additional evidence from sculpture, indicates that they must have worn a type of gown called peplos. This was quite a common garment in the ancient world, best known to us thanks to the Greeks, hence the name. It was made by wrapping a piece of cloth around the body, almost like a towel, and pinning the front and back together at the shoulders. In Britain's northern climate, it would have been worn over an underdress, and judging from other things we find in their graves, Anglo-Saxon women accessorised their dresses with beaded necklaces and girdles, which could be used to carry household items like keys. This is what we can imagine the female characters in Beowulf wearing, adorned additionally with golden arm rings indicating that they belong to the royalty. Status, ethnicity, role within the household and public rank continued to be expressed through clothing even as women's dress went through major changes during the Christian period. By the 7th century, when the Anglo-Saxons were converting to Christianity, women appear to have abandoned the peplos-style gown under the influence of Frankish and Mediterranean fashions, 
which favoured instead a sleeved robe and a hooded cloak fastened on the front by a round brooch. For high-status women, it was also common to wear expensive necklaces of gold and gemstones, which often proclaimed the owner's piety in the form of crucifixes or little reliquaries. Christian fashion also demanded that women cover their hair, resulting in the adoption of veils, which could be plain and practical or richly ornamented and accompanied by embroidered headbands. Surviving literature shows that women were often reluctant to part with such expensive items, even as they became nuns. The Venerable Bede, for instance, speaks of the outrageous behaviour of the nuns of Caldingham, who, instead of devoting themselves to prayer and to poverty, put aside all respect for their profession and, whenever they have leisure, spend their time weaving elaborate garments with which to adorn themselves as if they were brides. It is often forgotten that, at this time, there was no firm agreement on the uniform of nuns beyond a general notion of modesty, so it's quite likely that many nuns we encounter in early English literature did not dress very differently from other women of their time, and the manuscript illuminations depicting them in more recognisably monastic clothes reflect not contemporary realities but the illustrator's desire to bring them in line with the ideals of the later centuries. Compared with the transformation of women's clothing between the pagan and Christian periods, the basic costume of the Anglo-Saxon man changed surprisingly little over the centuries. The accessories may have varied throughout the Anglo-Saxon age. Belts became less elaborate, trousers gradually grew more narrow, and at various points men experimented with the shapes of their coats and cloaks, but the basic ensemble of short tunic and trousers remained the same for centuries. And it is in fact not that different from the 21st century man's uniform of sweater and jeans. This extreme conservatism is partly explained by the lack of necessity to change, because why would you fix what isn't broken? But it also seems that there were other issues that prevented Anglo-Saxon men from swapping their short tunics for the longer Roman silhouette. There may have been a lingering perception, as expressed by the Frankish Emperor Charlemagne, that foreign styles were feminine and traditional Germanic garments more manly. Indeed, we see lots of images of biblical figures and characters from antiquity wearing long tunics in Anglo-Saxon manuscripts, but when it comes to depictions of the Anglo-Saxons themselves, there are surprisingly few such images. It is only towards the end of the period, and only among the top echelon of Anglo-Saxon society, that we find men wearing an ankle-length gown, sometimes accompanied by a long cloak, and most famously seen on King Edward, for whom this style may have been a conscious demonstration of his imperial ambitions. Even so, there seems to have been a degree of anxiety about this fashion, which we can see, for instance, in the apprehensive remark by the king's biographer that his clothing was chosen by his wife. As for the military costume, despite plentiful allusions to armour in the heroic poetry of the Anglo-Saxon period, the rarity of mail coats, cuirasses, and helmets and graves suggests that armour was too valuable for most people to own, or, if they own it, to throw it away into a grave. So, for the wealthy, armour was clearly a symbol of high status and wealth, and it's important to remember this when we encounter scenes in heroic poetry where armour is broken or buried with the heroes, as in the famous funeral scene from Beowulf. The sparsity of evidence from actual armour, though, makes it hard for archaeologists to interpret the things we do find, including the fantastic items from Sutton Hoo. It's quite likely, though, that the ornate helmets that we have were never worn in battle, and it's safe to say that throughout this period, the equipment even of high-status warriors must have been relatively simple. As for the commoner, it was not unusual to fight without any protective equipment at all. To sum up, while it is important to strive for accuracy, we must beware of assuming that all our evidence reflects real life. Descriptions of literature are brief, archaeological finds rare and diverse, and many illustrations in manuscripts are probably imaginative. But there is no reason for us, as readers of early English literature, or even as reenactors of Anglo-Saxon history, not to combine evidence with imagination, as I'm sure Anglo-Saxons did themselves in their art and literature. Before you click off, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening, and a special thank you to Katie Newell for letting me illustrate this talk with pictures of herself and her Anglo-Saxon reenactments.
I hope this talk has inspired you to look further into all things Anglo-Saxon and that you enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>